So welcome to the Offutt School Presents series. I'm Chris Mason, and I have the honor of leading the Offutt School of Business with Concordia College, and I'll be your host for some of the morning. Uh, first, I wanted to bring your greetings from President Bill Kraft of Concordia, who is back in Moorhead impatiently, and I underscore impatiently, uh, waiting to recover from a recent knee surgery and wishes he was here. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Andrea Walsh, uh, of Health Partners as our speaker this morning, and are also thankful to have Tammy Lee, one of our own Concordia grads, uh, CEO of NanoCore, to moderate the conversation. We look forward to hearing from both of them after the breakfast. From our beginning in 2012, uh, the Offutt School of Business was founded to unify the richness of liberal arts education with the rigor of a first-class business school. We continue to work to provide a premier undergrad business education program focusing on global learning, entrepreneurship, ethical decision, and leadership. I'm especially pleased to update you on a couple of items that we have at the school right now. As we plan to build on our strategy of already talented staff, we're looking to strengthen our faculty ranks in marketing and entrepreneurship, and uh, also to add to the agribusiness side as well. So I um, wanted to uh, uh, give you an idea of some of the things that, that we've been going, going with. The agribusiness program actually is one of the only programs in the United States which is taught in a business school rather than an ag econ program. We also just uh, started having the entrepreneurship program roll out this fall where we have a certificate of nine credits to allow non-business and business students to understand the idea and the mindset around how entrepreneurs work as well. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to introduce um, this morning to have uh, the invocation by Sarah Anderson. And Sarah is, uh, comes from a small town in Minnesota. And as, as I was told by the staff, their morning newspaper actually has the local sports scores, the morning dining, and all the events on the front cover. Uh, but she has uh, excelled and, and found her way through Concordia and through uh, a number of, of ventures and has done an amazing job in her career. So I'd like to introduce her this morning. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I have to say great kudos to Concordia to make an agribusiness as a farmer's daughter from southern Minnesota. I think that's super exciting. Um, brief thoughts before we have our prayer. On my shelf at home, it's a six slot photo frame. In that six slot photo frame, there are five pictures of beautiful, brilliant young women, myself and my four college roommates, and a picture of a rock. Now, for those of you in the audience who are commerce, um, you might know what that rock is. It's the Mission Stone. And so for those of you who have not been to Concordia's campus to see this rock, it has engraved on it the mission statement for Concordia College, which reads, the purpose of Concordia College is to influence the affairs of the world by sending into society thoughtful and informed men and women dedicated to the Christian life. Now I think those of us who went through Concordia have hopefully held on to that mission, and I have been blessed by my education there and throughout, and now I'm blessed to work at Health Partners that really embodies a very similar mission and set of values. So the mission of Health Partners, led by Andrea Walsh, is to improve health and well-being in partnership with our members, patients, and community. And the vision statement is health as it could be, affordability as it must be, through relationships built on trust. And so there are some common themes as I look at those two statements. I think it's forward thinking. It calls us to action, and we cannot do it in silence. We cannot just be in our business office, we cannot just be in our operating room, although it's a great place to be. Um, we need to be in relationship with others, we need to be in community, and we need to continue that thought process throughout our business lives, whether it's marketing, or legal, or taking care of patients. So please uh, bow your heads and pray with me. This is an invocation, I'm gonna give credit to the writer Zola White. She is an African American woman who started a restaurant chain in the south side of Chicago. Loving God, bless all those gathered here today as we come together in friendship and fellowship. Thank you for the blessings of our individual and collective God-given gifts. 
place in our hearts the desire to make a difference to our families, to our community, to our country, and to the many cultures and peoples worldwide. Give us balance in times of distraction and uncertainty. Help us move towards our goals with determination and always with an abundant sense of humor. Thank you for food in a world where many know only hunger, for our faith in a world where many know fear, for friends in a world where many know only loneliness. Please bless this food we are about to share, those who prepared it, those who serve it, and those who have worked to make today the special event that it is. For all of this, we give you thanks. Amen. Enjoy your breakfast and conversation, and I'm sure we look forward to hearing some interesting conversation later. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our conversation moderator, Tammy Lee, and our featured speaker, Andrea Walsh. Tammy is a 1993 graduate of Concordia College, where she majored in political science and communications. She's currently the CEO of NanoCorp, a medical device company based in Red Wing. Before being named the CEO of NanoCorp, she was the CEO of Recombinetics and served in a variety of roles within Carlson, Delta, Northwest, and Sun Country. So that's kind of a theme that's, that's going along with that. We're grateful for Tammy for her leadership also as a member of the Board of Regents of Concordia College. Coming by vocational interest in healthcare naturally, Andrea Walsh is a daughter, granddaughter, and a great granddaughter of three generations of physicians. Appointed President and CEO of Health Partners in 2017, she leads a team of over 26,000 people, which represents the largest consumer-governed nonprofit healthcare organization in the nation. Prior to her lengthy career at Health Partners, Andrea practiced law and served as an assistant commissioner in the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Kansas, go Jayhawks, uh, and the University of Minnesota Law School. Andrea is committed to the community service that they use and also serves on a number of boards, including the uh, Greater Twin Cities YMCA, Downtown St. Paul Alliance, Greater Minneapolis St. Paul, and other foundations. It's not clear whether Andrea's service to the YMCA board with Minnesota Timberwolves CEO Ethan Casson influenced the Wolves' acquisition of Jayhawk Andrew Wiggins in the first round of 2014 NBA draft. But even so, local fans are appreciative if that was the connection. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Andrew Walsh and Kenny Lee. Well, this is going to be fun. We, I am so pleased to be up here on stage with Andrea Walsh. We've known each other for a number of years, and it's such a pleasure to sit with such an amazing and inspirational female CEO in healthcare. So thank you for joining us today at the Offutt School of Business. So Andrea, you've had a really long and distinguished career in healthcare. What are some of the biggest changes you've seen over the past 25 years that you've been in this business? Great question. And actually, first, I'd just like to say how delighted I am to be here and how much fun it's been this morning to reconnect with folks I didn't know were Cobbers, um, and with a few colleagues, um, Dr. Mark Sanis and Dr. Sarah Anderson um, as well. So um, Tammy, I, I have been looking forward to this conversation with you. And as I was reflecting on you know, a, a long career in healthcare, I think the thing that amazes me most, um, where we were 25 years ago to where we are today, is the impact that technology has had on healthcare. And I think we're just getting started when you see those curves of the impact that technology um, has on different industries. It's a, it's a curve that goes flat, 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 and then suddenly just up like a rocket. And I think that's where we're in healthcare. I mean, it, in 25 years ago, the electronic medical record was just being introduced. It was, you know, uh, a tool that I think we recognize would be better than a big fat paper chart, but it had a long way to go. And frankly, 25 years later, it still has improvements that need to be made. 25 years ago, we were looking at same-day access um, and being able to walk in as something that, that was nice and differentiated. Now we fully expect that our personal devices will help us make an appointment, find information, give us our medical record, connect us to our care teams. And so 
I think technology is probably the biggest change. Well, speaking uh, of technology, I interrupt you. Sure. I think you may not have your microphone turned on. Can oh, you just check your. You are right, I don't. I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, no okay. problem at all. Well, speaking of technology, we need it to be able to be heard exactly. in this room, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the technology front, while you were at Health Partners, you created this platform, Virtuel.com, which has really reinvented or reimagined the way that people seek health care. Talk a little bit about Virtuel and how you came to create that, that platform. Great question. So how many of you have heard of Virtuel or have used Virtuel? Oh, I like seeing a lot of hands go up. So we've provided care to over a half a million patients through Virtuel. It's an online 24-7 clinic for about 65 conditions. It's the stuff that you know you have. So think pink eye, think sinus infection, urinary tract infection, all those things that when you have it, you know, and you know it's going to be a hassle because you're going to have to make an appointment you're going to have to, you're going to have to get care and oftentimes get a prescription. So we created Virtuel because in this Twin Cities market, we've been blessed to be in a market that is super innovative. And once upon a time, retail clinics were innovative. They're not so innovative anymore. At Health Partners, as retail clinics, we're innovating and frankly taking some of our primary care patients away because they were more convenient. You could just walk in on demand, we decided, you know, how can we out Minute Clinic, Minute Clinic? Oh, and good. so Virtuel was really our answer to out Minute Clinic, you know, to, to out Minute Clinic. So it's a 24 7 um, system today for 65 conditions. I will tell you, just in the last year, we've added dermatology. Um, so treatment of acne can be done online. Uh, we've added birth control. In the state of Arizona, you can get birth control without a, without a doctor's visit. The, the guidelines around birth control have, have changed. And so as we look at Virtuel and the ability to deliver care online, I think we're on the front end. It will never replace the relationship that a physician and a patient have, but for some of the parts of, of healthcare that our patients view as more transactional and quick, convenience wins out and we have to embrace that and figure out how to meet our patients there. Well, and you came to that through, so you became CEO after being the Chief Marketing Officer. Right. And everybody knows Virtuel because of that virtuel.com. It's stuck in my head. I mean, you must have created <laughs> yeah. that thing, right? It's called an earworm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, is there, is there some, can I go on Virtuel yeah. and get rid of that earworm? <laughs> yeah. I, I tell you what, I, I, I want to, one thing I want to share with you is what I think is next in that same spectrum of Virtuel type care. We just this summer rolled out a, a new, um, a new uh, uh, way to use technology um, called eConsults. And it is a way for us to connect our care system. So we're a large multi-specialty group practice. So we have primary care, specialty care, and our clinicians practice in hospitals and clinics and ambulatory surgery centers. We know our patients want convenience and they want affordability. So the notion behind e-consults is to be able to enable our primary care clinicians who are seeing a patient in an exam room and have a question that needs a specialist's engagement. So maybe a Dr. Mark Sanis infectious disease question that a primary care clinician wants to ask and instead of saying to the the patient, gosh, you need to have a second visit, I need to send you to Dr. Mark Sanis, um, the, the primary care clinician would say, you know, I, I, I've got a question, I think that you need to see a specialist. Would you like me to reach out to my colleague um, and, and find out the answer and, and have a consult with my colleague, um, or do you want the appointment? And for some patients, they will say, I want to go in and have that appointment. But what we found is for a lot of patients, what you want is the answer to your problem. And so for our primary care clinicians, it's been a great way to build practice across our care group. And I think it is a way that we're using technology again to connect the dots and to make it more convenient and more affordable for our patients. That's fantastic. And you really put the patient at the, at the front. This is yeah. a very patient-centered approach to making sure that they get the answers that they need in a timely fashion. So besides technology, you're one of the largest, uh, you are the largest consumer-governed nonprofit healthcare system. Where is there room for you to continue to grow? Um, that's a, a great question. And from my vantage point, I think growth comes through building those trusted relationships. And Sarah mentioned the importance of trust and relationships. So when I think about our growth trajectory, it will hinge on how good a job we do at making it simple and affordable for people. Um, healthcare is complicated. 
it's expensive, and, I, and as we listen to what our patients and our members are telling us, they're saying we need you to make it simple and affordable, and I think the healthcare organizations that crack that code will be the ones that grow and thrive. That's a really great perspective. Thank you for sharing that. So when you started 25 years ago, uh, healthcare was really about fixing the body, fixing the broken bone that Dr. Sarah Anderson does, right? Now you're also focused on fixing the whole person and have had a really great focus on mental health issues. Tell us about what you're doing at the forefront of helping people with mental health issues. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, you would think that, that physical health and medical health would always ride side by side and there would be that holistic total person focus, but you're right in healthcare that that has come later. One of the things that we know from a mental health standpoint is that one in four people at some point in their lives will suffer from a mental illness and the average person may take up to 10 years to reach out and get help. The stigma around mental illness is incredible. And so at Health Partners, we have a large behavioral health practice. So we are there to take care of you when you need it. But we know there are a lot of people who need it that aren't reaching out and access is a challenge. Um, so we um, began a campaign called Make It Okay, which really is all about tackling that stigma and saying, you know, how, how can we make it as comfortable for you to talk to somebody about mental illness as it is for you to talk to somebody and support somebody that is dealing with a cancer diagnosis. I mean, just think about your, your friends with college-age students or think about Concordia College students. If students have a physical ailment, oftentimes support naturally surrounds that person. If people have a psychotic episode or a big major depression, think about how often that person might be alienated and not get the support they need. So Make It Okay has been about how do we equip people to have those conversations? Um, and, and I think we're making progress. That is a great uh, statement that you made because at Concordia, about 30% of the incoming freshmen already have a diagnosis and the mental health issue, whether it's wow. depression or another uh, aspect of that. And at the University of Minnesota, I heard the new president speak. She said uh, some 40% they think yeah. of incoming freshmen. So I guess we're a little less mentally ill at Concordia than the University of Minnesota is what I'm trying to say. Gosh. Not much, but yeah. it, it, is a, it, it is not a laughing matter though. Yeah. Mental health is a yeah. vexing, vexing issue. Totally. What do you think is our biggest challenge today? Is it mental health issues or physical health issues? You know, I think it's whole person issues, that it's health and well-being in its entirety. Um, and so it's, it would be hard to say it's, it's one or the other. As you were talking about, and as I heard a laugh on, on mental health, one of the things that I've loved about our Make It Okay campaign is early on as we launched it, um, John Moe from NPR called and said, I've got a great idea. If you really are serious about tackling the stigma of mental illness, um, I want to do a podcast with you. And so he came um, to our offices and talked about his vision for how he could reduce the stigma. And it was through a podcast called The Hilarious World of Depression. Have, have, how many of you have downloaded The Hilarious World of Depression? OK, so this is the tip for you of the day. If you, if you listen to podcasts, download it. It's been downloaded over nine and a half million times. Wow. And, it's, and it is to, on the top, it's on the best of lists for podcasts across the country. And his theory was, he is a comedian, and he is a, 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 a newscaster, and his theory was if he interviewed comedians from around the country about the role their mental illness plays in their success and in their career, how they tap into their own vulnerability and their own challenges, that that would do something to help crack the code. So we're now in our fourth series. He's talking not only to comedians, but also to artists, um, to um, musicians, um, and now this year, um, athletes. So really a full, full spectrum, and I think it just makes it so obvious that mental illness um, picks, on, picks on everybody. I mean, there is no one who is, who is um, safe or, or out of bounds um, in terms of the impact. That's, that's right, and it, it, I'm glad that we can actually joke about it, that there's a hilarious way of talking about mental health issues because it makes it more approachable for well, people. In fact, when he, when he said he wanted to call it hilarious world of depression, honestly, we, we were, 
a little bit. Um, well, it took us a little, yeah, from a marketing standpoint. And a we were lawyer, like, too. I yeah. Mean, that's <laughs> yeah, it's like it's not funny. Is this okay? But but, uh, but sometimes you, make it okay. you do make it okay. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the things that you mentioned to me when we were talking the other day is that you're so proud of your children's health initiatives, the first thousand days and the work that you're doing there. Share with this group about what you're doing at Health Partners. Sure. So um, with a focus on health and well-being and with a focus on partnership with our patients, members, and the community, one of the things that we know is oftentimes the healthcare industry hasn't focused as much on children. Um, and and our, our children um, really are our future. And what happens in the first thousand days of a child's life really sets you on a trajectory to be able to become a lifelong learner or not. So 85% of your brain develops by age three, the connections. And it's not that after age three it's too late, it's just you lose that super important window around connectivity. So we're just, we, we've created, we've done some work in the community to create a community-wide movement called Little Moments Count. Um, November 19th, we will have our fifth annual community gathering to talk about Little Moments Count, and we're working on a social media um, campaign um, and the point of little moments count is just to emphasize that for zero to three, all those little moments count. The interaction, playing, singing, talking, reading, um, that's really what builds kids' brains. Um, and if we can get that done by three, we just set ourselves on so much better trajectory for being ready for kindergarten. And you mentioned to me that even at the um, one of the last visits before a mom has her baby, you're already getting hands in the books of, or books in the hands of new mothers. Right, so, so actually we initially, we began our children's health initiative because our pediatricians, our OBs, our, our family practice, our family uh, medicine clinicians were saying, okay, we, we know um, a couple of things. We know that we could do a better job supporting our parents um, and our babies if we practice together. So, so oftentimes, OB and pediatricians are, there are pract one's practicing and, and caring for a baby and one's practicing and caring for a mom. So our first focus was internally, what could we do as a system to improve children's health? And we realized one of the things we could do was implementing Reach Out and Read, which is a program for a well child visit, where as part of the well child visit, um, you get a book. And so now our OBs at your final, in your final weeks of pregnancy, you get a book as part of Reach Out and Read, where we talk to a soon-to-be mom about the importance of interacting with that, that baby. Um, we also have, have begun to screen our, our moms for healthy pregnancy on the front end and postpartum depression um, in the pediatrician's office or the family practice office on, on the back end so that we make sure. Uh, we know lots of times moms do a better job caring for their babies than they do for themselves and we know postpartum depression can get in the way of those little moments that count so we're also trying to blend that medical, you know, physical and mental health together around the, the unit, the family unit. For the whole person, the whole mom. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience. So we're going to have some students that are collecting questions from you. If you've got a question, please pass them to Eric and other students that are going to be walking around collecting them. They'll bring them up to me. And while he's doing that, we'll continue the conversation here. So as you look back over your career there at Health Partners, what has been one of your proudest moments, the thing that you feel best about in your career in healthcare? That's a hard question because I, 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 a couple of things come to mind. One is I think that um, healthcare is such a team sport. And so I'm proud of the culture we have in our organization. We, we talk about it as head and heart together. And the fact that we can do so little individually and we can do so much collectively. So I'm really proud of that. Um, I'm also really proud of the commitment our organization has made to being a place where every person is welcomed, included, and valued. And that work really began in our boardroom, where our board took a look at healthcare disparities and said, you know what, we are top notch when it comes to taking care of, of white people. And we need to do a lot better job when it comes to taking care of our communities of color. I mean, the Twin Cities, we have some of the worst healthcare disparities gaps in the country. 
And Health Partners is one of the largest healthcare organizations in the community, has an obligation to helping figure out how do, we, how do we fix that, how do we partner to change that. And I'm proud of the progress we've made, but I wouldn't want you to hear me as like, I'm proud of it, check, we're done, because I feel like we are just in the, the you know, we're, we're just in the front end phase still, but, but that is work that needs to be done. So you talk about taking care of diverse populations you have a, a fairly diverse board. You're a consumer governed board. Tell us how that influences the way you run your business and provide health care. Yeah. Um, I feel like we are so lucky as a health care organization that we have a consumer governed board. So our board of directors is 15 people. We have four physician members and 11 consumer members. And our consumer members are elected from people who carry a health partner's card, so have our insurance. Um, or get their care from our system. And for me, I feel like that gives us a, a compass, a true north. I mean, it is really clear when we look at decisions in the boardroom, what should guide us, and it is the interests of our patients and our members. We are not a for-profit stockholder company. I think of our obligation as being a, a mission dividend, so to speak, to be able to better serve um, people. And that is just, I mean, that, that really gives us clarity around purpose that I think is important. As a nonprofit, though, uh, there are a lot of nonprofit health care systems, but you still have to balance your budget. You still have to deliver health care in an affordable way. With the rising cost of health care, how are you able to make it work at Health Partners yeah. and still deliver costs or care that's affordable for the patient population you're serving? I think you're so right, Tammy. We are at a really interesting point in the health care industry because the cost pressures uh, need to be stemmed. I mean, our, our patients and our members can't afford to pay more. And our, and our reality is the healthcare system is expensive. Um, we are a nonprofit, no margin, no mission. We have to be able to have a margin to be able to continue to reinvest in the programs, in the services, in the medical equipment, um, in the people you need to be able to deliver the best care. And we have to accept the imperative that the cost structure in the industry today isn't what the cost structure needs to be long term, which is why figuring out how do we use technology, um, how do we create and innovate in care delivery space so that we're more efficient, more effective, so that we don't waste any resource. And you think about, think about your own personal experience in the health industry, whether it's health plan or care delivery. We know we're an industry where, where we've got disconnects, um, where we are not as efficient as we need to be, or where we are using resource um, and doubling up on it because maybe that test result didn't didn't quite get to where it, it needs to be, or maybe you have uh, not stayed within one system, but you have done your, gotten your medical care from three or four systems, and as a result are getting you know, maybe two to three times more care than actually is gonna do, right. do you know, what you need. Um, so it's complicated. So technology is both a disruptor and a cost-saving or efficiency tool for you. <laughs> yep. Um, a lot, the, we, aren't, we weren't as technologically advanced when you first began your career in healthcare. Tell the audience about where you started. You didn't just land in the CEO role. Oh, sure. Um, so I yeah, actually began my career, as, as Chris, Chris mentioned, um, I, I was actually a law school classmate of, of um, Thank you. Bob Thunheim who's sitting right here at the, the front uh, table. So I went to the University of Minnesota Law School and practiced law um, for a few years. I then went to the Minnesota Department of Health um, and was an assistant commissioner right at the height of health care reform. So Minnesota Care had just passed, which was fantastic because it was Minnesota's answer to how do we make sure people have access to insurance coverage. Um, once that passed, to me it was clear that the, the action was going to be in the private sector, um, in the industry itself, and I wanted to be in the industry. I went back to practice law and help support clients who were working on care transformation and the like, and I found myself at Health Partners. At Health Partners, I began in government and community relations and then spent 15 years as the chief marketing officer and then just the last two as the CEO. 
But you actually, one of your first early paying jobs was in this sector, too. Before you, oh, were, yeah. before you were doing picking weeds and among the beans. Oh, so, yeah. now, so now we're to the true confessions yes. part. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we were actually at, at our table this morning as we were having breakfast talking about what our first jobs were and how did your first jobs influence uh, what you think about. And, and for some of us, we were weed pickers for our grandmothers um, <laughs> or our parents. Some of us were, were, were painters. Um, some of us were babysitters. Um, all of us, I think, concluded we did. All did a little yard work and a little babysitting. <laughs> my, first, my first paying job outside of family payment um, was in a hospital kitchen. Actually, I grew up in Rochester, um, Minnesota. My dad was a nephrologist at Mayo, and I worked in the St. Mary's kitchen. Um, and I was sharing with the table, I could, I could make breakfast for all of you um, <laughs> from that experience. And my first W-2 job was emptying bedpans as a certified <laughs> nurse's aide. So I went from there to CEO of a med tech company. So you never know. I, and I would way work. rather fix a lot of eggs and oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got some questions from the audience here. So this might be a this might be a bit of a bumpy ride here. We'll see what their questions are. All right. here, but I'm sure you're ready for them. Um, so you it said you brought over. You know, Concordia College has a great healthcare program there. Mm -hmm. They've got a great program. The Offutt School of Business is fantastic for aspiring business students, but they're really adding into the health disciplines. And they brought 15 students here who are interested oh, in healthcare nice. professions. So what is a piece of advice you would give for a future healthcare leader, the students from Concordia College or, or anyone who might be considering a, a career in this profession? Yeah, and I got to meet a couple of, of the Concordia students at the health partners table this morning. So, you know, I think as a student, um, whether it's healthcare administration or frankly any other um, degree early on in your career, just staying open to the possibilities, I think it's really hard to, to to set your sight on one single career path. And in healthcare administration, it, it oftentimes isn't a A to B to C to D. So think about what opportunities will allow you to grow, what opportunities open more, more doors, more windows, um, so, and, and then take risk. Fig, figure out, you know, don't feel stuck. Don't feel like you have to, to do something just because your degree says so. I mean, a, a lawyer's not often a chief marketing officer. Yeah. Uh, you know? Right. Well, and I started out in TV news and ended up as CEO of a med tech company. There you, you go. You never know where you're going to yeah. end up. And that great liberal arts founding that we have at Concordia College is really a great pathway to almost anything you want to do in life. That's right. But it's also about the values and growing up and totally. having to work as a young person, work your way through college. Those are the things that, that really help you get ahead in life and career. Yeah, I think you're right. So I have a question here. Somebody in the audience is a family member who's being treated in Fargo by Sanford Health and also the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Can you say a few words about how, despite competition among health systems, how do you collaborate with other health systems to deliver the best care to the patient? Yeah, so, so collaboration is an important part of, of health care. And I think oftentimes um, many of us have family members who get their care from multiple um, health care systems. And we're lucky, actually, in the state of Minnesota, um, we have, and in the upper Midwest, we have some of the best health care in the country. And I think oftentimes you don't realize how good you have it right at home. Um, the important thing from my vantage point is, is for family members to ask questions and not to be afraid to ask questions and not to be afraid to, um, to make sure you understand what's going on. It can be hard to, but um, you know, whether, whether it's getting care at Sanford, getting care at Mayo, getting care at Health Partners, Fairview, Alina, um, our care systems in the community regularly talk to each other. The electronic medical records today, Mayo, Sanford, and all the care systems in this community nearly are on the EPIC platform, which is an electronic medical record. We have the ability to read medical records. So if you, a patient shows up who's received care from another system, um, we have the, the ability through EPIC to be able to pull up that medical record. That really advances and enables progression of care. It enables you to make sure that you're treating a patient appropriately um, and that you're not just simply relying on what the patient may or may not remember or what the family may or may not know. And you know, you think about when you're sick, you're not at your best. It's oftentimes hard to, 
to convey exactly what's going on. So that ability for a medical record to, to connect through systems, I think gives us a, a start. And I think that's important as it relates to those trusted relationships. And you mentioned though asking good questions and not being afraid of asking questions. You had a bit of a different vantage point growing up in a family of physicians, growing up in yeah. Rochester. How did growing up in that family of physicians and in that, that arena really shape you as a leader in healthcare? Um, a couple of things. One is I think the, the calling that physicians have is around caring for people and serving people. And I think when you grow up in a household um, where you see the impact that, that care has on people's lives, um, that, that's an important thing. I think you also come to realize the important role health plays. So there's so much focus on care. But care is really oftentimes what happens when health is absent. So as a kid growing up in Rochester, my view on who came to visit us was sick people, sick family people, right. um, sick friends of the family people. You know, it, it, uh, people would come in from out of town, um, you know, sick not feeling well, and so it also really gave me a bent and a passion around health and well-being and on uh, about what can you do um, to take care of yourself and, and prevent illness and disease to the extent that you can. That's a unique vantage point, and so is the vantage point of, of the health of communities, which is really core to your mission. Yeah. And your, your focus on health partners really being committed to community health and to public health. How did you come to that vantage point? to make that commitment to public health and yeah. to serving diverse communities that, that are probably most at risk for having good health care? You know, I, I think frankly it's, it is being mission centric. I mean, if your mission is to improve health and well-being, you have to be out in the community. You can't get it done by yourself. Mm -hmm. So every female CEO, every CEO gets asked about work-life balance. How is your work-life balance and how does that affect your own mental health? So, so here's what I would say about work-life balance, um, is you can't measure it by the day. You have to take a longer view, because if you don't, you will burn out. And if you don't measure it periodically, you will burn out as well. So, you know, there, there is no perfect, I have three kids, they're all grown and launched um, now, but I, I, I look at young parents with kids um, who are balancing a full family life and a full work life, and I think, gosh, we need to figure out how we support each other, because I feel like I was a much better mother because I was working, um, and I was a much better executive and a much better better employee because I was a parent. And so I think you know being able to bring the whole of you home and, and to work, that's really what balance is about. I think so too. People ask me if I do yeah. yoga, if I, yeah. what I do. No, I, I repaint my walls. That's my oh. thing. Because <laughs> I'm not good at yoga or meditation, but I have a really <laughs> fabulous painted house, so that's my... I have to exercise. For, okay. for me, the, the trap is no exercise. That what, that's what gets things out of balance. Yes. Yeah. So on the topic of balance and advice for young women in the room who are thinking about this, you mentioned that you're a better a mother, a better wife, a better executive. Yeah. What would you tell other women who are thinking about a career and working their way up the executive ladder? Um, I think you just have to be true to yourself because we all have a different, a different gauge of what's going to work with us, or work for you, and it's completely okay to, to strike out your own path. It is fine. It is fine. I mean, in my own career, um, I, it, at the, in 1999, I actually jumped off the executive track. My kids were young. My husband was, was in a venture startup business. I, needed, I couldn't be a good executive and a good mom at the same time. It didn't mean I didn't want to work. I just needed to work differently. And so I think having the courage to be true to yourself and say, I, I'm not going to think so far ahead, that, you know, not overthink it, just and not underthink it. I mean, it's a, it's a balancing act. But I think taking, taking the risks to try to figure out what's important and when you look back, what will make you feel good about the time, how you spent your time. So this is going to be a, a, a tricky question here. Uh -oh. um, 
What is your opinion on the potential for a public option or Medicare oh. for all, the policy implementation, yeah. and how that, that's a lot of the chatter in the 2020 election cycle. Totally. How do you respond to that as CEO? Yeah. So I think that is a great question, and I think the reason we're having the conversation about public option is because health care is too expensive. No one can afford it. I think the challenge in the public option or the Medicare for all is understanding what is it. Mm -hmm. It is a quick, slick tagline, and, and I think people think they know and understand what it is, but I think asking the questions of how will it work is really important. So my perspective would be in Medicare for all. Part of, what's, part of what is super important is that everybody have access to health care coverage. So the ACA was great because we got access to health care coverage out of it. The ACA wasn't so great when it came to stemming the cost and the rising costs of health care. So we need to fix the ACA. Medicare for all, I think, is teed up as the quick fix. The, the problem I see in the industry of health care is that we are paying for it by units of service, mm -hmm. piecemeal payment, and we are hoping by some miracle if we just continue to pay for units of service care, we will somehow get better health and we won't. And so what I worry about in a Medicare for all debate is that all we're doing is building on what is a broken infrastructure in terms of how we pay for care. So that, that um, piece of it is a challenge and it's particularly challenging in Minnesota because Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement levels for care systems across the community are fundamentally different than they are in other parts of the United States. So if you are a care system in Florida, in Texas, in New York, in California, you are going to make up to two times as much. The Medicare fee schedule is dramatically different than it is here in this state. So when our community thinks about Medicare for all, we need to know and understand that today our care systems can't live on a Medicare fee-for-service base alone. And so, you know, that, that, uh, that, that's just a reality. So Andrea, you've spent time in public policy working for the state government. You mentioned as an assistant commissioner of health. If you could wave your magic wand, what's the one thing that we could fix in the pu public policy arena that would have the most impact in reducing costs and uh, ensuring accessibility for more people? Yeah. Um, well, I, I would take the politics out of it. I mean, if, that, if I could wave a magic wand and say what would be the most impactful thing that could happen is to get the politics out of health care, it is such a partisan, uh, a partisan issue, and it's a big challenge because what happens when it's partisan, no matter which side of the aisle you're on, is it prevents good long-term planning and thinking. And I think about for us as an industry, what's important is thinking not what's happening next year, but what's happening in three years and five years. And so, you know, I, I'd wave a wand and say, let's make it bipartisan and let's figure out a roadmap that makes sense. The government role in healthcare is really important. People need insurance. We need to make it more affordable. There's room to get that done but the politics just get in the way. It makes it very difficult to accomplish anything yeah. for the benefit of people. So tell us what's on the horizon. As you're planning, as CEO of Health Partners, what are you looking at at three, five, 10 years from now? That's a great, th a great question. Um, I would lead with, we need to make it simple and affordable. We need to answer that need that, that people have to be able to, to get the care they need. Um, and, and the coverage they need in ways that are simpler um, and, and easier um, and more affordable. So that definitely um, needs to be the focal point. Uh, so simple means easy, convenient, reliable, um, important. Affordable means I can afford the premiums, I can afford to get the care when I need it, where I need it, and I have a mechanism so that I don't get surprised by what it costs. Um, and I think affordable also is a call to us as an industry to figure out how do we drive efficiencies um, in, our, in our operations that, that make it um, reliable and sustainable long term. So um, you know, working our way to a place where, annual, where, where our cost structure can, can live within annual inflation as opposed to something more. And it's a challenge just given the health status of the community. 
So what's going to be the biggest disruption in healthcare? Is there anything really Ooh. cool and interesting you're doing at Health Partners that you can tell this audience about today in yeah. your R&D or something that's yeah. on the horizon? And since you're not bound to shareholders, we're not yeah. releasing anything that the no, Wall no Street can't hear about. So yeah. what's really cool and interesting that's, that's in the pipeline for you? Well, I am really excited about some of the innovation underway um, and linking care and that relationship we have to the people we serve with technology. So we are working so that you will be able to make appointments um, online across our entire multi-specialty group practice. Um, you know, all other, think open table. We're gonna have open table like capabilities so that when you need to make an appointment, no matter the specialty, you will be able to get that done. So that work is in process and by the end of next year, should be across the system. Many healthcare organizations will say you can make an appointment online but it only applies to certain kinds of appointments. So we are actually doing the system-wide work to make that a reality. E-consults is a good example. Um, we are using telemedicine capabilities, so our care system actually spreads across the greater Twin Cities area. So there's like 135 miles end to end in terms of our service area footprint. And we know there are communities like Hutchinson, like Amory, like New Richmond, where access to care and access to specialty care is needed, and having a physician behind a wheel to drive out to a community is not the most efficient and effective way at it. So we're using tele telemedicine to be able to connect people via a screen in a relationship with, with local care teams, so I'm excited about that. And from a plan standpoint, I'm really excited about our health and well-being solutions. So we are just launching um, up in the St. Cloud market um, a health and well-being community-wide uh, coalition and consortium to support people in staying healthy and taking those steps that will really make a difference. That's really exciting, and I like your open table concept, and I even ask you if you could take it a step further. Like, when I get on open table, I usually can't get a reservation until 8.30 at night, and I can't get in the six o'clock slot or the seven o'clock slot. Is it possible to provide healthcare appointments at 8.30 at night because people don't get sick on a nine to five schedule? Is that something that could happen? So we're having a lot of conversations internally about the fact that, that, that you know, people used to talk about banker's hours. Mm -hmm. Now, now you don't because banking is 24-7. Healthcare is moving that direction. In fact, we know as we've extended appointment hours um, in our primary care clini clinics, evenings and weekends, they're the first appointments that fill up. So that transition is underway. I think the other thing about the um, online appointment scheduling is it also gives you the ability to um, figure out within our system where are the other locations where you may be able to get an appointment. So if you can't, if you can't get in at one clinic, but you can get in at one of our other clinics four miles down the road, you'll be able to, as a patient, trade off. What, what's more important to you, timely and quick access, or, or a clinician of your choice? And what we know is for about 60% of us, we don't have a primary care relationship. So in healthcare, we talk about primary care being super important, and it is for coordination of care. And we know the reality is for many people, millennials, in particular, when you haven't needed much care, you may not yet have found that relationship, and that's where convenience, we've got to be the easiest to access. Thank you, Andrea. Let's give Andrea a big round of applause. Thank you for this conversation today. Thank you. And I wanted to thank our corporate partners and our sponsorship for the event. So please join me in a round of applause for all the sponsors. Our names and logos have appeared throughout the program today, and without them, we certainly couldn't offer this. I'd also like to thank uh, our event planner at the Outfit School, Carol Hedberg, wherever Carol is in, in the room. Uh, she is, is the one that allows us to pull it off without a hitch. If you have any uh, suggestions for the future or interested in learning more about how to engage your students as mentors or potentially uh, with internships, uh, our staff is going to be available afterwards. Uh, and if you'd like to be on the mailing list for future events, please feel free to leave your business card at the desk where you're entered in. And finally, I want to invite you to the next Outfit School Presents for a distinctly different business enterprise. It's theater arts. 
So we're pleased to present the business of Broadway, which is a conversation with a trio of accomplished professionals representing acting, directing, and producing. So join Tina Marie Casamento, Ron Katz, and Jim Kirstead at the Broadway for performing arts in St. Paul on March 31st of 2020. We hope you can be with us with, uh, with a very illuminating and unique conversation because we don't always, always often think about how do you put a production on and the business components of it. And I'm glad to say we also have theater art majors who are also doing minors and majors in business. So it's bridging those, those two areas. So thank you very much for coming and, and have a great day.